Hey Leuven, waar kan je hier meer te bakken voor hem? Good. Um, I have a presentation which is pretty laden with facts, but what I'd really like to do is talk with you guys. So give me five, ten minutes to go through the first several uh, slides and get you some basic facts. And if you want to shoot in with questions, go ahead. What do I want to talk to you? Probably the biggest political and economic issue of this generation. The 19th and 20th centuries uh, were time of class conflict. Politics was about rich and poor, and political conflict was framed in terms of classes. Times are changing. Um, the welfare state is going bankrupt. It has huge consequences for you. Politics will change as a result. For a very simple reason, the welfare state is going bankrupt. Most of you, your generation, and people younger than you will end up paying more in taxes than you will receive from the budget. That's very different from your parents and your grandparents. This will have a huge impact on the politics of the 21st century. I'd like to give you some basic facts and some speculations on how it will affect society and politics. And I'm happy to take any questions from you. Um, in case you are doubting me, um, here's a quote from the uh, report of the trustees of the US social security system. Here's what they have to say. The, counts, the, uh, the counting demonstrates that some generations are scheduled to receive benefits with present value exceeding the present value of their dedica dedicated tax income, while other generations are scheduled to receive benefits with a present value less than the present value of their dedicated tax income. Now, this is for me pretty big stuff, uh, pretty scary stuff actually because this is the official public sector the government essentially saying some generations meaning the older people the generations of your parents and grandparents have received via the budget more they paid in on average in taxes while you guys will receive less you'll pay more in taxes you'll more will be transferred from your pockets via regulation than you'll receive this has a huge impact on politics I pose to you. How is it happening? Well, um, we, have, we have still have the welfare state. I pose to you, and this might be unpopular with some of you, the welfare state at a certain period of time, to a certain extent, was a pretty useful idea for a brief period of time. Um, I already hear some laughs. Yes, it was. Um, it helps move the transition from the agriculture, from an economy do, do, uh, dominated by agriculture to one dominated by industry. It possibly saved capitalism as we know it in the 20th century. However, there is something as having too much of a good thing. The welfare state worked pretty well when each subsequent generation was larger than the previous generations. You could tax the larger, younger generations to provide generous benefits for their parents and grandparents. It worked very well in many countries. For example, in my country, um, post-World War II, when Poland was totally destroyed by World War II, um, there was no other way to support the older people. However, um, at some point in time, we should have made the decision, probably somewhere in the 50s or 60s, it was impossible because we were then a socialist dictatorship, to start dismantling the welfare state. We haven't done it. As a result, we'll need to do it now, it will be a lot more costlier and the conflicts associated with it will be much sharper. Now, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are economics students or sociology students, how much do you guys know about uh, changing demographic trends over the last 50 years? A lot, not so much. Who would say you guys are pretty well aware of what's going on? Okay. Most of you know that previously uh, the uh, younger generations, each subsequent generation was a lot larger than the previous generations and now we're living in an age of a demographic transition. Societies are getting older. This has a huge impact as I've already alluded. When you have when your, the generations of your parents and your grandparents, it was typical they had several sisters and brothers. How many of you guys, is there anybody here who has more than two brothers or sisters? One, two, three, four, five, six. If we had asked the same question 50 years ago, most of you would have raised your hands. Huge change. Um, 
I'll call, now I'm using a pretty nasty word. Uh, you guys are getting screwed. That's right. Uh, you are. Um, the pension system, the housing market, the overregulation of professions, the overregulation of labor laws, and many other regulations are taking money out of your pockets, putting it into the money of the, gener of the older generations. However, you will not get to do the same to your children and your grandchildren. The bankruptcy of the welfare state will be left for you guys to deal with. You will be the generation that will have to dismantle it, pay the costs, and deal with the associated nasty uh, politics. Um, since we only have uh, about three quarters of an hour, I'll mostly concentrate on the pension market and briefly, time permitting, allude to the other ways money is transferred out of your pockets. Um, by the way, uh, this is an issue which is happening right now. 10, 20, 30 years ago, some, a handful of academics would talk about it. If you open up the newspapers in any country today, there's a good chance you'll find an article which is alluding, if, uh, alluding to these issues if you know what to look for. Here's an article from the Financial Times from uh, three days ago. It says that the uh, public servants are getting pensions which the government cannot afford. Basically, they're saying that pensions are given, uh, promised, but, not, uh, but the, uh, not sufficient provisions for um, funding for these pensions have not been made. By the way, one thing they got wrong is the government ca cannot afford. Well, not exactly. It's future taxpayers, the young citizens, you guys. There is more traps like that um, to, uh, to which I'll allude shortly. Here's a piece of data for the uh, European Union. Right now, the uh, old age dependency ratio, which is basically the, number of uh, the projected number of people above age 65 to, age 15, uh, to people between 15 and 64, is under 30. Within your lifetime, it's set to almost double. Think what that means in terms of supporting the uh, pension systems, which in most of Europe are supported via the budget. Well, here's an example of what it might mean. Here's some data from Poland and the US, which basically tell the same thing. However, in Poland we, uh, and the US, we put different things in the nom nom denominator and numerator, so the graphs look like they're going in different directions, but they're saying the same thing. In Poland, which is the chart on the left. Can everybody see the chart, by the way? Is it legible? Actually, uh, I'll ask the question of okay. Is there anybody who can't see the chart? No, okay, fine. Uh, the chart on the left, which is Poland, is basically the number of working age people for every pensioner or disability payment claimant. If you look back to the 60s, there are about 12 working age people for every person, pensioner and disability uh, pay, uh, payment claimant. Right now, it's collapsed to under three. Think what it means for the economics of pension systems. 12 people supporting one pensioner or disability payment claimant, versus under three. And by the way, this ratio is set to get worse. The chart on the right-hand side is uh, the US social security system. Back in 45, for every 100 contributing workers, there were two social security claimants. Guess what the number right now is? 35. And within your lifetime, this number is projected to increase to 50. Think about the tremendous difference. Two claimants for every 100 payers versus 50, five, zero claimants for every 100 payers. Huge difference. Basically means there's going to be less and less money available for uh, pensions, social security, medical services, or taxes will have to be increased. Probably a little bit of both, which I realize might be an unpopular proposition to make in this room. Why is it happening? Here's a Polish example. Um, what you see in the uh, blue is the uh, population of Poland in age groups, 18 to 34, 35 to 54, 55 and up. When you take a look at this chart, you realize that we had, by the way, this is data for the 2001 election because it's the only election for which I could find data on the voting patterns by age. We have a lot more young people in Poland than older people. However, when you look at the number of voters, you realize that the reverse is true. Older people tend to uh, vote a lot more often. Politicians know about this. If you're asking, why is money being taken out of my pockets? Well, here's one explanation. You guys, your friends, 
You're not voting. Politicians know. That's why you're getting screwed. You have yourselves to blame. Why does it matter? Um, well, one of the reasons is the pension system. The politicians have promised to uh, our grandparents, our parents, that pensions will be provided for in some countries fully, in some countries partly uh, by future taxpayers. Now, these pension liabilities have not been booked, have not been recorded in official statistics. What I've done is I've taken a, uh, all the academic literature I could find, and I basically took averages of estimates for various countries to come up with an estimate of how large versus uh, gross domestic product uh, these implicit, these hidden pension liabilities are. In some countries, they're as high as 400% GDP. The general rule is that um, emerging economies, uh, countries in Asia, which have made less of these promises, have smaller hidden public debts. Countries in Europe, uh, country, basically OECD countries, have significantly larger implicit pension liabilities. Now, this is liabil these are liabilities which are in addition to official public debts. Uh, these days we're talking often about the um, official public debts, and as you can see from the chart, the chart on the le uh, left hand side, the red line, that's the ofi official uh, debt to GDP. Uh, the story for the official debt to GDP for uh, most advanced countries is that in the 70s, official debt to GDP was about 40%. Recently, it increased to about 70. As a result of the last crisis, it's getting close to 100. But there are also the hidden liabilities I've just mentioned. And this is this slide here. The blue parts of the chart are the official amounts of debt the government has officially owed up to in its statistics. Guess what? It's a tiny part. The implicit liabilities are a lot larger. Now, we're talking about the uh, debt crisis. When we're talking about the debt crisis, when you hear the politicians, the media talk about the debt crisis, they're talking about the blue part. It's tiny versus the uh, in existing uh, implicit liabilities. Now, some people are saying, well, if these aren't counted, these aren't real liabilities. Well, if they were right, we would basically mean that the pensions, uh, politicians in our name have promised to our grandparents and parents, will not be paid. I don't see that happening. Um, how many of you are economics students? Quite a big majority. Is there anybody in the room who knows the uh, who does not know the difference between a pay as you go versus a fully funded pension system? Should we take two minutes to talk about it? Okay, we will. Well, basically, um, a fully funded system is where you set money aside in your working life over the course of your working lifetime save it up and then use it when you retire. A pay as you go system is where one generation pays taxes to fund the uh, pensions and social services for your parents and grandparents, and your children and grandchildren are supposed to do that for you. Now, in the face of these huge rising uh, and rising, uh, increasing uh, implicit pension liabilities, a lot of experts are saying, well, we should move from a pay-as-you-go system to a fully funded system. Technically, it's not a bad idea because, as we've mentioned, the pay-as-you-go system worked fine, one generation paying for the next generation, when each next generation was larger. It was easy to fund pensions in that system. However, the generations are no longer increasing. In fact, in some countries, they might even be decreasing. So moving to a fully funded system where every generation saves up for its own uh, pensions makes sense. The only problem is how to move from one system to the other. Well, that's how you'll get screwed. Um, you'll have to pay for the uh, pension promises for your parents and grandparents, and as the, system, and as the systems in many of your countries will move to a uh, fully funded system or a partially funded system, guess what? You also have to save up for your own pensions. Oops. Um, why, is, why has this issue of implicit debt, if it's so big and so important as I make it out to be, been ignored? 
Well, in the past, there was no, no need to measure it. Until 100 years ago or so, governments spend, in any given year, spend the money they have received in taxes in any given year. Don't buy things like bridges, pay wages of a police, military administration. Only in times of war would they take on extra debt. However, with the rise of the uh, welfare uh, system, the uh, state budget started acting as a tremendous transfer mechanism and worked fine as long as each next generation was larger than the previous one. It hasn't been true in most countries for 20, 50 years now. Today, politicians find it most inconvenient to admit to the true state of public finances. Can you imagine a president or member of parliament saying, Dear voters, guess what? We're a lot poorer than I told you. I'll have to raise taxes and decrease investment in public services. I don't see that happening. They kind of started to admit the truth. Uh, for the past 20 years, statisticians and politicians have been talking in various organizations like the UN, uh, European Union, OECD, and they came up with a new system called the System of National Accounts 2008, and it's a uh, European equivalent, ESA 2010, which basically says, well, when, you guys, when the government does the, its official statistics, it should somewhere uh, include a supplementary table which gives some account of the um, implicit liabilities. Uh, there was a huge discussion about this, actually. Uh, the economists and the statisticians were saying, guys, we need to count it. It's a, it's a real liability. A society's uh, age, something that was a problem of the next generation, is becoming a problem of tomorrow, and soon will be a problem of today. But the politicians, for the reasons I've just mentioned, weren't very keen on it. In most countries uh, starting uh, this year, uh, in most countries in the European U Union starting this year, they will start to uh, publish this data. It will become more av available. Um, I'd, I'd say it's a pretty good time for you guys and for your friends to start learning about it, educating others, because it is the single biggest economic and political issue of your generation. How are we doing for time, by the way? Okay. okay? Okay, I'll keep up the speed there, but if you guys want to uh, jump in with any questions, do. Now, some people are saying, you know what, the stuff Pavel is talking about, it's not really relevant. We don't need to talk about it. First of all, implicit debt is only an uh, estimate. Well, yes, that's true to some extent, because it depends a lot of things like the rate of growth of the economy, birth rates, and things that will happen in the future. However, economies and uh, populations are big objects which just don't change course uh, rapidly. These problems are real. My estimates might be off by 5, 10, 15 percent. But you remember the slide with the blue and the orange uh, bars? It's a huge problem, huge, huge problem. Even if we're off with the implicit liabilities by 10, 15 percent, guess what? The debt crisis we're talking about in the media today is puny compared to what I'm talking about right now. Another, uh, explain, uh, another challenge is why account for only the debt of a state and not account for future tax receipts? Sounds kind of sensible, doesn't it? Well, not exactly. Um, first of all, if you're a prudent person, uh, you start accounting for your debt the moment you incur it. And you start counting your future earnings only when you've earned them. I mean, debt is here and now. We've already made these promises to our grandparents, our parents. The accounting to retire on money to be taken from us in the future as taxpayers. How much taxes will our government be able to raise in the future? Huge question, we don't really know. Why not account for a few other future expenses is another challenge. Well, because other future expenses like wages of policemen and firefighters can be controlled to a large, much larger degree. You can have less policemen or less, less firefighters. I mean, it might be sometimes hard, uh, not enough policemen, more crime on the street. But yes, you can manage the uh, size of police force. You can use technology in firefighting to perhaps reduce uh, personal costs. With pension promises, in most countries in Europe and the world actually, these are uh, promises which are legally enforceable in the court of law. If you, in most systems, if you have accrued uh, pension rights, you can actually go and sue the government in court to get your pension paid. In some countries it doesn't work like that, but in most it does. Uh, another argument is focusing on implicit debt will lead to cuts in social spending. Possibly it might, but the point I want to make to you, both on uh, spending cuts and potential tax raises associated with these issues, the sooner we deal with them, the smaller they'll be. The longer we wait, the longer, the larger the problem will get. Um. 
Another example of how we are getting screwed is the housing market. Politicians like to intervene in the housing market. They have all kinds of great policies. You know, housing, house ownership is good for families. So they kind of tend to come up with all kinds of brilliant ideas. Here's a little subsidy for first-time home buyers. Here's a subsidy for mortgages. Well, that doesn't really solve the housing problem. But what it does is each of these interventions increases the price of housing. Also, governments like to regulate the way houses are built. What that tends to do is limits the supply of housing. The result you get is what you see on this chart here. You see, uh, this is a chart which shows the price of housing. It's an average index for a lot of developed economies from 1870, i.e. 19th century, to right now. What you see in the modern era, starting in the 50s, housing prices started to increase significantly. Now, what do increases in housing prices caused by government policies actually mean in generational terms? Well, who owns the housing and who needs to buy the housing? Well, older people need to own the housing and it's you guys that eventually need to buy housing. In fact, buying a house for most of you will be the single the single biggest expense you'll ever uh, make in your lifetime. Now, if the government is basically increasing the price of an asset which is owned by the older generation and needs to be bought by the younger generation, it's transferring money from you guys to the generation of your parents and grandparents. Oops. I've already mentioned some. By the way, if you guys, if somebody, want, I have a lot of facts which I'm kind of quickly jumping through. If, if any of you guys want a copy of this presentation, there'll be an email for me uh, at the end. Um, yeah, we've kind of mentioned that subsidies. Anybody from the U.S. here? Good. Um, have you ever heard about the 1977, 1997 Taxpayer Relief Act? Yes. Do you realize that? In, permanently gave a uh, tax-free capital gains on sales of personal residences up to 500,000 for married couples filing jointly. <coughs> Have you ever thought about the fact that it, was a, it caused a one-off increase in the housing, uh, in housing prices? That it constituted a transfer of money from your pocket to the older generations? Unless you already own the house, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> I'm taking this example because it's one of the many examples of uh, policies which governments under uh, supposedly benign pretenses implement, which have huge uh, tra uh, trans uh, generational uh, transfer consequences. Another one, which is, sounds on the face of it pretty sensible, is from the UK. If you've ever been to the UK, you might have heard about the Green Belts. They have uh, around 14 of their largest cities. The idea is that to co it was. It was an idea that seemed kind of sensible. Well, you don't want urban sprawl like they do in America. We are in Europe, after all. So let's put green belts around cities, outside, in, inside which you can't uh, build more buildings. Kind of like all medieval cities in Europe. You had a wall, and the whole city had to fit inside the wall. Well, um, it was a fine idea back in the 50s when uh, most of these green belts were invented. However, it didn't take account of the fact that since then the population has been growing, growing significantly. If you limit the uh, availability of land for new housing, guess what? You're rising the price of the existing housing stock. Many, many, many policies about which most of the voters don't know, and even if they do know, don't think about the uh, transfer, transfer consequences between generations. The problem is that a lot of these interventions by governments transfer money from the pockets of the young to the old. Now, my guess is you've seen uh, the chart on who votes in Poland. Actually, the same is pretty true in most of the countries elsewhere. Young people don't vote. People start to vote in larger numbers when they reach 30. Uh, politicians know that. Sorry, it's your fault. Um, laws about the labor markets and trade and laws on trade unions. Um, basically, tra what are trade unions? Trade unions are, are associations of mostly working people who tend to be older on the average. So guess what? They're fighting for the interests of people who already have a job as opposed to people who are trying to break into the job market. What are labor laws doing in most of the countries? They're also um, putting restrictions on competition for jobs. They're privileging those that have jobs on the average older people and um, 
causing significant costs to the uh, younger people. In Europe, in most countries, we, are, uh, we have seen the development of a dual labor market. Mo on the average, mostly older workers have good, well-paying jobs from which it is hard to get fired, and the younger people are hired in increasing numbers in temporary jobs. Um, you, pro you probably know that. I mean, you guys are looking for jobs, right? Now, uh, professions, let's... Actually, you know what, let's, first, let's take a break here. I have a lot more slides, actually, but um, first of all, any questions? Anybody wants to disagree with me, uh, ask questions about the data? Hey, uh, really, thanks for your talk. That's really interesting, but uh, it's kind of depressing, I have to say. Like, this is all really, really interesting, but uh, I'm kind of like, what now? Because that seems, uh, uh, what to do about that? <laughs> what to do? Um, actually, I... Uh, I thought that question might come up. <laughs> Uh, first of all, let's admit we have a problem as a society. Um, these promises have been made. The generations of our grandparents and our parents are counting on future taxpayers, you guys, on providing for, for them in their old age. Uh, the problem is that when you look at the numbers, uh, the taxes that would be required uh, to support the promises that have been already made are significantly larger than whatever uh, is paid right now and probably what you can bear to pay. Uh, compromises will have to be made. But first of all, most people don't know about these issues. Like I've mentioned, in Europe, most of the governments will start to admitting in their official publications to the implicit debt problem starting only this year. So most voters don't even know we have a problem. When people talk about the debt problem, they talk about the tiny part of the official debt and don't talk about the implicit debt, which is a lot larger in most countries. So first of all, admit we have a problem. Learn about it. Educate ourselves. Educate others. Um, other ideas which might be unpopular in this place, well, one will be popular, start cutting the welfare, uh, size of a welfare state. Okay, we've made promises, but we have to say to our grandparents and parents, sorry, um, we can't afford to do it. In most places, we'll probably also need to raise taxes somewhat. I know a lot of people here might not favor the idea, but when you start looking at the numbers, um, the demographics are pretty scary. Um, the promises that have been made in terms of the uh, euro, dollar, zloty, foreign, whatever values are also pretty scary. Um, the politics will be nasty, which is why I'm making the claim that um, for the past 100, 150 years, a lot of politics has been about issues of class. Starting, in the, uh, starting now, I believe, um, more and more issues will be about generations. Um, transfer of, gen of wealth from one generation to another. Um, so some of the ideas might revolve around lowering the voting age. Think about it, um, 18, which is the time most, uh, you get to vote in most countries, is probably just about the very worst time to give people the vote. I mean, you're leaving high school, you're leaving the homes of your parents, starting your university life or your professional life. You have so many things going on in your lifetime uh, that voting and thinking about voting is probably not exactly exciting. Now, why are we have? Why is the uh, official voting age in most places set at 18? Well, historically, the link has been to military service. Um, in fact, some places like Switzerland, where they had st started experimenting with voting a lot earlier, the earliest statutes said that you can start to vote when you're capable of raising a sword. <laughs> Well, we no longer raise swords uh, in battle these days, but the link, the historical link is still there. But why is 18 a good voting age? Why not 16? When you're still at home, you're still in high school, there isn't much change going on in your life. Maybe it's a good time to start experimenting with uh, learning about politics. And think about it. In most countries, the age of consent for sex is below 18, in Europe at least anyway. 
I'd say it's pretty, probably a lot more important to know who to date rather than who to vote. I mean, my own personal view, but um, the age of criminal responsibility for minors in most countries is also below 18. I mean, why are we treated as adults if we commit a crime before 18, but are not deemed responsible enough to cast a vote? Um, now, I've mentioned the generational conflict. However, uh, one word of warning in terms of looking for solutions. Uh, compromises will have to be made. Um, societies that grow slower, societies that are more concentrating on how to divide the pie rather than grow the pie, tend to be nastier places. It's probably not the road we want to go to. So, I, I don't really have a very good answer besides uh, telling you guys, we're at a very early stage about educating ourselves, educating societies and our fellow voters. Sorry, I've been probably answering too long to such a simple question. Thanks. Hi, I'm from Poland. Um, well, we're in the same boat then. Um, well, I would like to ask you about some radical solutions. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, I am a little bit skeptical about democracies being able to cope with the problems that you just mentioned. Um, but what do you think, uh, in a good dictatorship, would it be easier and quicker to solve the problem you mentioned? I mean, apart, you can, you know, uh, respect democracy, and etc. but I, I'm just talking to you, and tell us, please. Well, tell you what, hard problems uh, often lead to the temptation of easy solutions, but with dictators uh, is the old ancient problem of who's going to control the dictator. I mean, uh, democracies are pretty messy systems, but at least we have some say in terms of what's going on. Um, I'm not a big fan, I, I prize my own liberty. I believe it's easiest for me to retain my liberty when I live in a society of free people. I am not willing to surrender my liberty to some dictator just because my country is about to bankrupt. I'd rather be bankrupt and still free rather than be both bankrupt and not free. Don't you think there is a possible uh, even more liberty uh, when we have a dictator I do not believe in uh, benign dictators. Um, the ancients have said that yes, it's possible to have good kings, but uh, monarchies tend to uh, evolve into tyrannies. For some reason, it always seems to happen. So even if we are able to find that one good guy to be the future king, monarch, dictator, guess what? Uh, his son, daughter, whoever, or the next uh, guy to uh, implement a coup would not probably be as nice. No, 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 and no. Uh, dictatorships are nasty, sorry. <coughs> Go ahead. Um, you were talking about, uh, yeah, so it's, it's going to be difficult to fund uh, all the uh, unfunded liabilities now, but uh, isn't there a very easy, uh, not very nice, but a very easy political solution to that, which is uh, mass inflation? And do you think this will be an option, and how do you think uh, the, both the older generation and the younger generation would react to that solution? Well, tell you what, um, inflation has distribu distributional consequences. However, um, this solution would have been easy 50 years ago or so. We've had, over uh, back in the 70s, most of the social systems throughout the world, since they've had to deal with inflation, have came up with a great idea of indexing. Most of benefits in most countries are in some way tied uh, to inflation, indexed to inflation. So you'd still have to change the law, so you'd still have to argue about the redistributional consequences. Yes, uh, uh, you are searching in the right direction. Uh, these promises will not be fulfilled. The welfare state needs to be cut down in size. Um, how it will happen in all of these countries, I have no idea. But I know the math. Um, just doesn't add up. Go ahead. 
Uh, well, hello over there. Um, actually, to be honest, when I just read the title of this section, The Clash of, the Clash of uh, Generations, I had very much high hopes uh, because I was expecting to be considered to have a more discourse on about what are the different mindsets between generations, which is kind of more, more overall discussion about how uh, generations think differently and how they therefore contribute differently to the society. So um, I also enjoyed very much the presentation so far, but I think it's it's uh, at a certain point uh, a kind of reducting all the discourse in just focusing on pensions where there can be much more else discussed about it. Um, however, my question would be, do you know or to your knowledge, is there any current research that is uh, showing how there might be a correlation between how young people think and old generations think and the, the way that they have contribute, they contribute to the society. For example, young people nowadays, internet, social media and all this stuff leads also to political apathy, non-participation in elections and everything. So do you have any um, idea to your knowledge why these differences in generations, in the way generations were raised and they were educated and so on, can contribute so that they contribute differently to society? Thank you. Okay, one thing that I do know is that most of the people are not aware of this. And this shapes their perceptions. Most people in most countries where we have pay-as-you-go systems are saying, hey, I've contributed for my pension all my life. I've paid all this money to the government, so all this money has been saved for me. So, um, yes, this presentation focused mostly on economics because perceptions, political perceptions and mobilization are different country, between countries. But one thing which is common for most of these countries is uh, older people don't think about the money they've paid into the pension system, the pay-as-you-go uh, pension systems, as something that was spent on their parents, i.e. our grandparents. They think about money that was saved away for them. It hasn't. And even if, when you present numbers to people, uh, there are actually people who have done that, there are surveys on that. Guess what? People reject that. No, no, I've been paying all my life. Money was deducted from my wage all my life. There's money set aside for me. So I'd say um, there's one thing that generations have in common, uh, a lack of understanding of how the pay-as-you-go system works. It might be somewhat worse for the older generation because they haven't heard as much about it. Uh, a lot of economics professors these days in economics classes tend to talk about this. But uh, I, actually, when you look at uh, broad surveys, you don't find a difference between older, younger people in terms of how the pension systems works. In, in terms of mobilization, uh, uh, social media and whatnot, I won't talk about that because I don't know that much about it. It's very different in every country. And you know what? Most big political changes are obvious the day after they happened. Uh, most uh, waves of political mobilization the day before to most people people are not so obvious. Go ahead. Hello. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I definitely agree with learn more and educate, educate and others, that's very important. But on lowering the voting age in, in, in the UK, most of the support for political parties from young people goes to left-wing parties, to Labour and the Green Party. And I've just seen that the Green Party have just said that they're going to get rid of tuition fees and all the, all the money that's, that's cost. By lowering the voting age, are you just going to make this problem even worse? Yes, I've heard that argument, but I'd say let them make their mistakes as early as possible so they have more time to correct their mistakes and start voting for more sensible parties. Uh, hi, I wanted to ask you, like, um, there was one person which was um, saying something about uh, dictatorship and how it can be solved. I would also go to the uh, topic of democracy and in 21st century we have this strong fetish of democracy, everything has to be democratic. But uh, 200 years ago... European students for liberty, another question about dictatorships, what's going on guys? <laughs> go ahead, sorry. Well, okay, um, the thing is that uh, what you say here, like, to, to lower voting age and so on, what would you say about uh, taking, like, just, um, like, uh, banning uh, voting rights for people on pensions since they don't contribute to the system anymore with, uh, with, uh, with the taxes? 
Uh, that's a very nasty, slippery, slopey start. With those who are not, who are on pensions, then you start excluding those who are not paying enough taxes. Then you might start. If you know, well, for me, it's not, it depends if it's a problem for you because for me, it's not. Well, we've just heard from Zoltan. Imagine if uh, Mr. Orban heard that idea. Who would he be thinking of excluding? No, it's a very nasty and dangerous system. Look, guys, um, dictatorships have a certain appeal. They seem a lot more efficient. It's a lot more easier for a guy like Mr. Putin to say, hey, we're taking Crimea tomorrow. Um, but guess what? Over long distances of time, democracies seem to thrive a lot better. Democracies are a lot more resilient. Uh, democracies are messy, they're annoying. You have to talk to people with different silly ideas. All these stupid people, all these undeserving people. You know, we all have our pre preconceptions. And uh, you have to get along with all those other people. You can't exclude them in a democracy. Um, but fact is, uh, all societies, all economics from time to time uh, have to deal with unexpected external shocks. It might be the price of oil, it might be some ecological uh, problems, it might be some economic problems like pension systems. And guess what? Over long periods of time, democracies uh, tend to solve these problems without internal warfare, without societies collapsing. Dictatorships, in the short run, might sometimes deliver pretty good economic results, pretty good social results. But over long term of time, they just don't work. But they work in much longer than democracies, actually. We've had democracy uh, in most of the say, European countries for like 100 years. Mm -hmm. and there have been monarchies uh, over 1,000 years. And some of them were great. That's true, some they did. But well, uh, democracies don't work in most of the countries. You know what my problem with mon monarchies is, besides the fact that they tend to degenerate into tyrannies, is that in monarchies you only have one king, and then you have a lot of serfs and slaves. Um, Why slaves? <laughs> 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 well, because the king has all the power, he gets to decide. Look, um, if I was a monarch, I could say, hey, I don't like this guy's questions. Send him to the jail, hang him. <laughs> I mean, that's the way uh, monarchies have tended. A lot harder. Uh, democracies have had their failings, and, uh, but it's a lot harder. Look, I like, I prize my freedom. And I believe it is easiest to uh, defend my freedom when I'll be surrounded by other people who have their freedoms to defend. Once we start living in a system where there's one guy who's deciding about everything, we'll tend to need to suck up to this guy, we'll need to go to that guy to get privileges and decisions, and um, it'll be a very... I just don't want to live in a system like that. It's a value-based choice, but history has shown that given where the technology is, given where our societies uh, uh, are, for the last 200 years, democracies have worked a lot better than dictatorships. Please go ahead. Um, thank you for First of all, I have a question about the welfare state. Mm -hmm. uh, because we were saying to cut the welfare state to the sustainable size, what would that be? What would you consider a sustainable size? And because we mm -hmm. said already that we cannot really fail on the promises that we made to our grandparents. All right. Um, so I don't really see that happening given the, the, uh, the curve of the aging. Mm -hmm. Okay, did everyone hear the question? Can you repeat? I'll repeat the question because I have a mic. Um, basically, the question was, hey, um, you said that we need to cut the uh, welfare state down to size, but you also seem to say that you can't uh, renege on the promises we made to our parents and grandparents, so how are you going to deal with the problem? That was a question more or less, yeah? Yeah. Um, well, the answer is we can't fully renege on the promises we've made to our parents and grandparents, but we need to tweak these promises. Um, maybe grandpa and grandma are going to get 90 cents or 80 cents of the dollar, euro dollar promise we made to them. Um, it's very, I mean, a lot of economists are making estimates. For example, the estimate in the U, uh, for the U.S. Is, is that if you were to put a social security, Medicare and Medicaid, on a sustainable footing, you would need to make a change uh, or equivalent to more or less 3% GDP. That 3 doesn't sound a lot, but that's 3% of GDP. 
Guys, we have five minutes. I guess two more questions. Yeah, I'm waiting with a mic here. Um, Sorry. Oh, where are you? Here. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, first, a bit of a technical question. Uh, the basis of your critique is largely uh, reliant upon this idea of implied debt. Uh, and I've heard this before by Ma Michael Tanner, for example, and I'm very much interested how reliable is the calculation of implied debt and also what kind of statistics do you use? Because for most countries, when I try to search for this, these statistics, first off, there are very, very large discrepancies between the estimates and most countries don't even have such statistics available. And maybe the second part of the question would be uh, what would kind of be the models uh, current in the world that you would suggest are doing a, a good progression from the pay-as-you-go systems to more privately funded systems. I don't know, would it be Chile, for example, or Australia, or countries like that? So. Sure. Um, implicit liabilities are an estimate. But guess what? Official debts are also an estimate. Countries issue part of the debt in foreign currencies and currencies tend to change. So even when you look at things which seem to be set in stone, like the official debt, it's also an estimate. Yes, the implicit debt is an estimate to a much larger degree because it relies on things like um, future growth rates of economies, future demographics, how many people are going to be born, how many people and how quickly or how late are they going to die how generous the welfare system is going to be. How quickly will we tweak the promises we've made to our parents and grandparents? Um, so these are estimates, but guess what? Uh, if you look at the literature which is start on implicit debt, which starts basically back in the 70s, maybe one or two papers a year, now it's a torrent. There are probably 20, 30 papers a week published on the topic right now. Uh, the estimates used to be huge because people would be looking at different things. They'll be looking at medical uh, promises we've made. In some countries, the government pays for medical, uh, medical uh, for health services. Uh, some would be looking for pensions, at pensions for the same countries. Now the methodology is getting standardized. As I've mentioned, there is a uh, new methodology uh, for counting GDP, which is now recognized by mo most countries. In Europe, we are uh, starting this year. Most countries are going to publish a supplemental table, which will be done according to the same methodology. And yes, these are estimates, so they might be off, you know, 5%, 10%, whatever, but an estimate is still better than no information about the issue at all. And what was the second part of your question, sorry? Uh, what kind of models do Since uh, the pension systems and the promises that have been made to the older generations are very different in the different countries, there is not one model that works. Um, you have some country, also you have different demographics. You also have different flows of migrants into countries which tend to improve the situation a little bit. So I'd say the basic template is you will need to cut down the welfare state. You will need to uh, not deliver on a part of the promises you've made to the generations of your parents and grandparents. Probably as a part of a compromise, unfortunately, probably not popular in this room, taxes will have to rise a little. How it will be made will also depend on the politics of each given country. So the solutions will be similar in broad outline, just as I mentioned, but the detailed implementation will be very, very different. But what's most important is whatever solution is taken, the faster these choices are made, the smaller these adjustments will be, made, uh, will be the less drastic they'll be. I guess we're, do we have, do we have time for one more question? Or are we? Yeah. Okay, one more question. Um, yeah, so thank you. Um, my question is a communication question because there's obviously two ways to go about educating people. One is economics and throwing numbers at people. But I look at this and I wonder what your opinion is on framing this in the same way that um, if you call it the left frames issues of social justice or class warfare or identity politics. Do you think there's a use in framing in the way that you worded it, generational theft uh, along those lines and communicated it along those lines? Well, uh, 
the reason why I use these uh, somewhat radical terms is I realize this is a late afternoon se session after lunch. I was afraid a lot of you might be dozing off. So this was just to keep you guys awake. Um, how, how, have I, how, I, how did I go about this in my country, Poland? Uh, I spent the last uh, 15 years educating journalists, educating politicians. The result is that um, Poland is probably the country in Europe where the term implicit debt, hidden public debt, is used more, more than any other place in the media in Europe. Um, that's what I uh, could have done, that's what I could have achieved. I just educated the people in the media about the fact that the de it exists. It's a huge problem. How I went about communicating it? Well, depending on who was in government, I'd go and talk to the media which tended to like the government less, and I'd talk about this hidden debt. Well, for opposition media, de hidden debt sounds like debt hidden by ruling politicians, so I kind of like picked it up. I, I've been going about it for 15 years, and guess what? Maybe not all of them understand the intricate points of how to calculate this implicit debt, but it's a widely accepted fact among the chattering classes in Poland but there is a thing called implicit debt, but it's huge and it's a problem. I guess our time's up. Thank you very much. Giga T. Crowdfunding for you and me.